goals of the Bring Back the Salmon program are to restore a self-sustaining population of Atlantic salmon back to Lake Ontario and to support a recreational fishery. These goals can only be achieved by having sufficient numbers of adults return from Lake Ontario to their spawning grounds in the lake's tributaries. There are many stages involved in this restoration, from assessing survival of stock juveniles, to conducting research on diet and movement, to using cameras and anglers to monitor when and where adults are returning. Let's explore how adult returns are assessed. After spending one to three years in the stream as juveniles, where they imprint by learning the smell of their specific stream, Atlantic salmon becomes smolts, which involves hormonal, behavioral, and morphological changes, and migrate to the lake. After one to two years in the lake, they return to their natal stream to spawn. During their spawning migration upstreams, they are sometimes caught by anglers. Ontario is divided into fisheries management zones and each has specific rules about catching fish. Anglers may target Atlantic salmon in fisheries management zones 16 and 17, which covers all tributaries flowing into Lake Ontario west of Trenton. But they must let them go after capture, a practice called catch and release. Anglers were recruited in a citizen science initiative and issued specific collector's permits which allowed them to legally take a tissue sample of an adult Atlantic salmon before releasing it. By extracting DNA from these tissue samples, researchers can determine the strain and parentage of that fish, as well as what life stage it was stocked, since family groups are stocked together. This has helped in the further refinement of stocking practices to focus on which stock strain and juvenile life stage result in the highest number of returning adults which currently indicates that Sebago strain and both fry and yearling life stages are the most successful. We can also learn about diet and habitat use through analyzing stable isotopes in these tissues. Stable isotopes are the ratio of two isotopes of the same element, and that ratio differs predictably due to environmental and physiological factors. The stable isotopes of carbon, for example, differs between stream habitat and the offshore lake environment, and so measuring these carbon isotopes can tell us something about the habitat use of that fish. Nitrogen stable isotopes reflect trophic level in the food chain, as their ratio differs between primary producers, herbivores, and carnivores. Lastly, if we look at the scales of these fish, we can infer life history information. The distance between rings on the scale, which reflects growth, changes from the stream to the lake environment and from summer to winter. Also during spawning, adults typically don't feed, and so we can see a mark on the scale where they reabsorbed some of the scale's calcium. Thus, from a small piece of tissue and a few scales, we can learn about the hatchery origins, diet, habitat use, life history, and past spawning events of each fish. Anglers also submit photos of the adults they have caught. These may be returning adults from fish stocked as juveniles, or in some cases, they are tagged broodstock. Broodstock are mature adults raised in a hatchery for breeding purposes. The Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry has tagged and released hundreds of retired broodstock to provide angling opportunities and to gather information about adult movement and survival. As of December 2020, 2,185 broodstock have been released, of which 4.3% have been recaptured. From this, we know that some of these fish swam over 300 kilometers across the lake. Angler photos of adults that aren't broodstock can provide additional information about migration timing, especially if these fish are caught in a river that has a fishway with a camera installed. These cameras are located on the Ganaraska River at Corbett's Dam, Port Hope, and on the Credit River at the Streetsville Dam, Mississauga. The camera consists of two parts, an infrared sensor that scans the fish and produces a silhouette, so that even in turbid water we can see how many fish are swimming past, and a camera 
that takes a short video of each fish passing by. Photos of adults can have their spot patterns matched with the spot patterns from the fish in the camera video, as the spot patterns are unique to each fish. This gives us information such as the minimum duration a fish was in the river before ascending the fishway, or how long the fish took after passing the fishway to swim upstream to its capture location. Without anglers, we wouldn't get this detailed information, as there aren't enough staff to survey all of the streams all of the time. Some juvenile salmon are also fin clipped, a process where the adipose fin is removed to indicate stocking origin of these fish. For example, all Atlantic salmon currently stocked into the Ganaraska River have an adipose fin clip, which means we can see if Atlantic salmon from other tributaries are straying into the Ganaraska River using angler photos and camera images. Combined, fishway cameras and angler reports allow us to determine the seasonal timing of adult migration into tributary streams, as well as assessing the presence of tagged or fin-clipped adults. Additional research is also being conducted by the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry to determine how effectively adult salmon and trout can find and pass these two fishways. To do this, researchers tagged rainbow trout, chinook salmon, coho salmon, and brown trout with a passive integrated transponder tag. These tags are 23 millimeters long and are injected into the muscle of the fish. These tags are dormant and are only activated when the fish passes by an antenna that generates a close range electromagnetic field. The antennae is placed across the stream and is connected to a scanner that records the unique identification number of that fish. The fish also had a floy tag attached below the dorsal fin so that they can be identified by anglers and also seen if they pass the camera. By placing antennae below and above the fishway, researchers can determine when a tagged fish approaches and passes through the fishway, and how long it takes to do so. They found that like most other fishway studies, not all adult salmonids can find the fishway entrance, though most that do find it successfully pass through. One final way to assess adult returns is to perform surveys to look for adults in the streams and evidence of their spawning activities. This is accomplished by walking sections of rivers that contain high quality spawning habitat and using underwater video cameras to check various habitat types. With experience, you can distinguish the species of salmonid that is visible in the water from the surface and video equipment can be used to confirm species identification and individual counts through comparing spot patterns. The size of reds differ by species, and even though there is a lot of overlap, they can provide tentative locations of spawning, which can be verified by seeing adults on the red, or by excavating a small part of the red to collect some eggs for genetic confirmation. Natural reproduction and wild adults have been documented for over 10 years. By using these various techniques, we can learn more about when and where adult Atlantic salmon are migrating to spawning grounds. The more adults that make it upstream to spawn, the better chance we'll once again have a self-sustaining population of this native species. Thanks to all the anglers that submitted photos of their Atlantic salmon catches and that practice proper catch and release techniques to ensure these fish will be able to continue migration and spawning. And to our partners, including the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry, for all the research that has improved this program.